Uh, great. Good afternoon, everyone. You know, when John and I designing the mobile reversion day, we always think about uh, what should we put in the last session, right? But we decided to put the most interesting one as the last session, the most exciting one, right? Uh, if you have enough coffee, that's great. But I bet that you don't need coffee to be paying attention to this interesting panel there, right? Uh, let, me, let me start this way. Uh, autonomous vehicle has captured our imagination for decades, right? Uh, particularly in the last like 15 years, so we, we're really serious about this. The society put, a, I mean, substantial resource to this, right? Uh, but then at the same time, let me quote the prior session, talk about the investment, right? One, uh, 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 Chris, you actually mentioned about uh, personal dignity, right? That's one dream that autonomous vehicle strive to achieve, right? Uh, older, sick, disabled, low income, whatever, that autonomous vehicle has the promise to really offer that dream, to offer the mobility with the personal dignity, right? Uh, but also at the same time, uh, Patrick mentioned the, uh, in terms of the, the current uh, funding a reality there. If you are a company with cash flow, you're probably okay. But if you're looking for cash flow three years on, five years on, you're, you're stuck really crash, right? So from the autonomous vehicle space, uh, investors are getting impatient, right? Uh, so here, there's a lot of kind of promises and of the, the difficulties, right? So here, I think I really have the best panel to join me to really collectively answer the question. We have a technologist, right? Professor, <coughs> Professor Raquel Ertesom, uh, founder and CEO of Wabi, right? Uh, we have uh, 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 Nick Grant, who is an insurer. So think about uh, how do you really allocate the liabilities? <laughs> we have David uh, Zipper, uh, I would call it a social, uh, uh, urban mobility social critique. We're right? asking why are we doing this? Uh, then we have investors, right? Uh, Chris Thomas are really investing in this space quite a bit. Yes, right. And then, of course, we have Mark Rosenheim to just give us the, from the regulatory point of view, what's the framework? Five people, I think, really the best I can imagine as a combination to answer these questions there, right? Uh, also, I want to prompt this about a few tensions that we are observing these days, right? For example, one, uh, everybody talking about we should share data, right? But at the same time, each company is guarding the data as the core asset. Right. How do you share your core asset? Right. And then more specific, then what type of data is feasibly shareable and what is critical to be shared? Right. Are the companies willing to do that? Right. Second one, we've been talking about how do we rationalize this risk? How do you allocate the risk to a different part of the society? But in the end of the day, you'll find it's a human emotion that drives a lot of our decisions. Right. When people see a particular crash, the media publicize, dramatize it, and then cause all this kind of a, a uh, 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 momentum going through the political process that lead to this year, right? And the last one, I will, I will end my introductory remark, which is from one side, I do see there's quite a bit of maturity of the data, uh, the technology over the last year. We're making really good progress here. We also see a quite a bit of rationalization of the business model to get, getting much, much meaningful there. But this is also the time that the public perception is getting a lot of problems, right? There's a lot of desynchronization in this, right? So those are a few tensions that I observe. I really invite the, the panel help us kind of uh, give us the kind of picture where we have been in the last one year, two year particularly, and what you see forward in the future. All right. For that, I will start with uh, Raquel Urtasan. Uh, you're really the leading technologist, like putting, uh, funding the Wabi as a company and pushing this technology forward. Uh, can you share us a little bit about uh, yourself, you know, why you founded Wabi, and what excites you in the last one year or the, into the future next year? Those are many questions in one, yeah, I guess. Um, so let's start by, uh, I guess, my journey to today. Um, so I've been an innovator in AI for the last 25 years, uh, right? really pushing into an idea that was interesting of an artificial brain to what it is today. And uh, prior to Wabi, I was chief scientist and head of R&D at uh, Uber ETG, which was the self-driving program for, uh, for Uber, where I work in robot taxis as well as self-driving trucks. And I founded Wabi because uh, you know, I saw that the industry had consolidated to an approach uh, that was what I call EV 1.0, that was very hand engineered that I didn't think that it was gonna bring us to commercialization at the scale with a deep conviction that we needed uh, some big step change to happen. Uh, and that was gonna come from AI, from kind of the next breakthrough. Um, at the time when I founded the company, we called this AI first approach for the lack of a better world. 
thanks to OpenAI, you know, we can now uh, call our technology that we've been doing for the last two and a half years as generative AI and people understand, you know, what we've been building, right? So, so that was actually very important to be at the forefront of innovation because we knew that technology would be kind of the next revolution and we could start a company and build it from scratch. Um, and in terms of the uh, differentiated technology, we talk about you know capital and whatnot you know, in, the, in the previous panel. So we have a much more capital efficient solution that is also much more flexible, generalizes much better through uh, gener generative AI technology, and that comes in you know kind of like two different uh, core pillars of technology that solves the pain points of the industry. On one side, we have a simulator, and I think we're going to show some uh, some stuff for, for the public here so that you can you can uh, see by yourselves where. You know, you can replace driving in the real world by building the metaverse for self-driving so that you can really expose the system to all the safety critical situations, all the things, corner cases, accidents, in a way that before you touch the road, the system is already very performant. So very, very different way to, to go around developing technology. And thanks to Gen AI, you can create this simulator in a way that has the real, the scale that you haven't seen before. And the other piece of technology is that we have a foundational model, a single AI system that drives the trucks that has a power that, you know, that we haven't seen before in terms of generalization to really handle all those situations on the road. So you end up with a very, very different technology that is kind of the next, uh, you know, uh, you know, next generation that is really going to revolutionize the physical world. Yeah, thank you. Maybe two things I'd like to maybe elaborate a little bit. Uh, AI as a concept for a long time remains mostly in the academic world, right? But just the last year, somehow the whole society waking up to it. You know, probably thanks to many of the large language models that, right? Uh, Rocco, can you give us a, maybe some basic one-on-one, -on -one, the, the, <laughs> the Gen AI-based approach versus kind of a classic approach? What's the difference and what particular worst advantage in terms of the interoperability, in terms of the robustness? Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, if you look at the evolution of AI, right, from, you know, the old school neural nets uh, that, uh, you know, in the 90s, I guess, we started playing with, right, to the revolution of deep learning that, uh, you know, already transformed the industry quite a bit, right, to what we see with uh, generative AI technologies, the ability for, you know, to really train from data in an unsupervised manner by just consuming data and uh, you know emerging concepts that are kind of natural for humans but not for machines, right? So we see you know an incredible power there, and then you can fine tune these models to do all sorts of different tasks, right? And then suddenly, kind of the ability to generalize, the ability to solve tasks uh, has gone to the next level where now you can really impact you know almost every single industry out there. And what we've seen, I think, what has been tremendous uh, to see is that, uh, you know, the fast pace of adoption, right? I think that's, for me, the biggest transformation is, like, yes, the technology is very powerful and it's been powerful for a while and continues to grow exponentially, but everybody knows about it. Everybody's using it, mm. right? And that's the big transformation thanks to, you know, I, I guess, see. Uh, chat GPT. Wonderful. Yeah, thank you. I have a second question on simulation, but I'll come back to you in the second round on this, right? And Nick, I got to you. So whenever new technology comes, comes in, there will always be some accidents, some mistakes made, right? So as a society, we have to allocate this liability in some rational process, right? You are from labor neutral, you guys are on the front line of, of this. You, you literally, that's your business to allocate risk here, right? So how is, you, you've been thinking about this uh, uh, uncertainty into the future about AV, but at the same time, as a different user, you have to get into the market, right? This is coming. So what's the latest thinking from your point of view? Yeah, it's a great question. So, so as an insurance company, well, one baseline thing for, to think about for us is we sell a product where we don't know what the cost of that product is. So we don't know if there's going to be a crash or incident when we sell you an insurance policy. So what we do is we spend a lot of time trying to forecast and anticipate what the, the cost will be of our product based on a, a series of criteria. So when we're looking at autonomous vehicles, obviously it's more nascent than a bunch of private passenger cars driving around a bunch of commercial trucks. Um, so we're, we're monitoring the different landscape of safety measurements. And some of those we understand better than others. And some of them are more directly applicable to how we'll anticipate what costs might be in this space and what it means to us. So at a high level, you know, if we're seeing the, the, you know, the safety case frameworks and adherence to that and how robust those might be. We're learning more about the simulations, which we're you know, trying to understand to the best of our ability. Um, but then you're starting to see, okay, are there the road tests that start to come into place in a real world that, that kind of create a set of criteria to measure against? And just to give context, you know, you might see those commercials where it's uh, Insurance Institute for Highway Safety gives it a five-star crash rating for this type of vehicle. That institution is funded by the insurance industry, and we, 
we have them crash test cars, and that institution also collects all the crash data for the industry um, on vehicles. And so we have a very robust data set to help us forecast what's going to happen. Um, you know, we're starting to see, okay, what's the parallel in the autonomous vehicle space? And so then we're looking into some of those um, like benchmarking type studies that you're seeing with Waymo and Swiss Re using the insurance industry ad database to start to measure performance based on the, the few million miles that we're seeing from you know the, the driverless Waymo vehicles and Cruz is looking to do studies with the, or did a study with the Maven data set from GM, which was like a ride hail comparison data set in the similar place. And that's the type of thing that is actually more uh, common for us in insurance companies. So we, we look at uh, different companies and transportation companies, and we measure them against what we know. And we say, okay, are you higher or lower than that? Or are there things that might change the outcomes of this particular uh, mobility company in a way that's different? And so that's, that's a very common thing to us. But just a, a practical matter, in, in our space, we would typically look at a couple hundred million miles before we start to assess credibility based on frequency and severity, so the number of times you have a loss and how big the loss is. Um, and though, so we're talking you know, a few million miles here, so it's very nascent, so that it gets to, all right, well, we wanna participate, we want to enable this, but we wanna do it in a way that's sustainable, makes sense, and um, anticipates a lot of the different dynamics that are gonna evolve in autonomous vehicles. And so, you know, if you think about what some of those might be, Today, and, and, and this is similar in, the, in the, the test phase of autonomous vehicles where the company owns the vehicle. That's, that's a normal thing for us. We understand that if, the, if it crashes, there's gonna be an outcome. But in a world where you start to go that the, the autonomous system might not actually be owned by the person who's driving it, you're now saying, okay, I've got a company who owns this vehicle who might is different than the company who installed or participated in the installation of the, the driver system on it. That is then uh, that having different shippers deploy a, a good or a package on that, that might be service to customers through another entity. So now you have this complex web of who's liable. And in today's world, often it's the operator. So if you're, uh, you know, a company delivering a package like Schneider, you might take on the liability for a crash. But now you have all these different companies and all these different entities, and is it the, the hardware? Is it the software that made a decision? Was there you know, gunk on the, the camera that, that forced it to make a, uh, a bad decision in terms of computer vision? Who was responsible for maintaining that? And so when we get back to the idea of, we care a lot about understanding and forecasting risk, these new liability dynamics are one of the things that we're spending a lot of time assessing and understanding because it's really important to us to be able to understand what's gonna to play out, and that allows us to help work with our partners, give them some guidance, and, and start to create a more sustainable discussion. Mm, great, Th thank you, Nick. Maybe one follow-up question is, uh, for AV to be deployed, there, there are kind of three bars to pass, regulatory, commercial insurance, and the public, right? For now, let's just focus the first two. From your point of view, the regulatory bar versus the commercial bar, are they, first of all, are they which one is higher or lower? Can, can they compare or are they just different nature, right? For you to evaluate that, do you have a different judgment from like NISA or well, how do you? I think it's a great question. And so I think <clears throat> one thing I would say is, you know, there are different stakeholders that we're all aware of, right? You said mm -hmm. the public and regulatory institution, insurance companies, we might have our, we're likely to have our own threshold. So if you think about what we do today, there's a distribution curve of risk that we insure. Some is really good and safe and you know, gets lower prices. There's some that's really severe and risky that gets higher prices. That's what we deal with every day. So we actually are very used to understanding that there's different types of risk and we need to try to understand them and put you know, costs and prices associated with them. So when we're looking at Tonus vehicles, the thing that we're, you know, what, from a safe, how, like how safe is safe in our perspective? Yes, we care and we want them to be safer than you know, a human vehicle. At the same time, we're very familiar and comfortable with the idea of putting a, a, a price assessment on them that, that runs the gamut. And so, you know, you might see a regulatory threshold be one thing that's like, okay, I think this is safe to be on the road, which might be different to us that's then, well, I can understand what that risk is. And if I can understand what that risk is, I can then provide sustainable insurance to it. And so I think one, like a, an example of that is we talk a lot about the 42,000 um, fatalities, which are you know, a lot, and we all want to see those go down. At the same time, you know, fatalities for us is maybe one to two percent, let's call it, of incidents, maybe nine, ten percent of bodily injury loss, which means, you know, people getting hurt. But bodily injury is only a one thing that we do. It's our property damage, it's our first product of vehicle damage. So 
we insure and, and cover a lot of incidents that we know are gonna happen that aren't fatalities. And so again, it gets back to, we just need to understand what those are so that we can manage it, accurately price it, have our partners know what that is, so that creates a sustainable business model for them. And so I think it's a good point that our threshold for understanding risk might be different than a variety of other stakeholders. Right, that also relates to the discussion between uh, a rational approach to analyze through a probability distribution versus a more emotional response to a dramatic individual incidences here. Right, yeah, I'll we'll come back to that, how to do. Uh, David Zipper, right, you've been writing quite a bit about uh, the urban mobility in general, but also specifically on how AV can play a role in this. Add us your thoughts to that. <laughs> yeah, um, nice to meet everyone. For those who have not a chance to meet, I'm a, a visiting fellow at Harvard in the Kennedy School, and I have a background uh, both in government and um, working with startups. And as Jinwa alluded to, I've written 100 plus articles in the last few years about transportation, technology, and society. And AVs has been a particular topic of interest of mine. I've written about it in the Atlantic and the Washington Post, um, Slate, Fast Company, and some other places. And I focus, especially compared to the last couple of speakers, I focus not on the how, but more on the why because I find myself having some pretty fundamental questions about why we're doing this, and why we, society should be pulling for it to succeed. And, um, and I, by the way, before I go further, I should also uh, just give a salute to Mark, if Mark Rosekind, if he's still here. I found him to be a really thoughtful sparring partner and, uh, and um, just sort of uh, a teacher about a lot of these issues because he's been so immersed with them for a number of years. But what do I mean when I say I think about the why? Like, I am try I, to me it's actually pretty clear that there are real downsides to self-driving cars if the technology works if they scale. I'm not going to focus on trucking here because I think that's actually a different case. I see fewer downsides there if if autonomous trucking succeeds. But if self-driving cars really scale, um, I mean, well, for one thing, for those who know the Jevons paradox, which has been around for 150 years. Uh, that, that showed the Jevons paradox basically demonstrates how when things get cheaper, we find new ways to use that thing. Uh, and that means that demand stays high. So self-driving cars along those lines make driving easier, effectively cheaper. All signs would suggest, based on what we know about human behavior, we'll find new way, reasons and ways to drive or purposes to drive. That means more driving. As we know, driving creates pollution. Even if these are electric vehicles we're talking about, they're still pollution from road dust and tires and, and brakes and such. Um, and the, the extra driving is going to, particularly in an urban area, could lead to catastrophic gridlock, which is the last thing cities want right now. We have some city officials here. I know that's not where we want to go. And also, because the, the whole purpose of self-driving cars, or a big part of it, is to make driving less burdensome, uh, that's an inducement toward maybe with that trade-off of commute time and where you live, you might say, I can actually live a little further out now from the center city because the commute doesn't bother me so much. If that happens in mass, we have a term for that. It's called sprawl. And that's where you end up with people who are going to be living more in the exurbs or further out. In that kind of environment, transit can't really work. Biking doesn't really work for the trips that you want. And by the way, you're also going to have people with larger homes. Larger homes create their own emissions, as we well know, because they require more energy to heat and cool and all that good stuff. Um, and um, and then for those who really who are per, like, if you think about the perspective of cities, there's a real question. This has come up in the last few months in public dialogue in San Francisco of you know whether of whether AVs sort of cement the uh, dominance of cars in a way that a lot of city, leader, city leaders and city residents don't necessarily want. Because for an autonomous vehicle to be useful, you want space to, to have it operate and operate smoothly and quickly. If you, create, if you allocate street space away from cars, self-driving or otherwise, towards buses or towards bikes, that actually makes a self-driving car less useful. That's a tension that has actually been at the, the core of, you guys may know about that coning campaign in San Francisco, where the people are like bricking uh, Waymo and cruises by putting a little yellow cone on it. Uh, I had some great Halloween costumes about this, by the way, if those who are on, on, on what we used to call Twitter. Um, but, uh, but anyway, uh, these are all like, I think, real, real downsides. And then the, the, on the flip side, you say, okay, what are the benefits? And although this was not something you heard about self-driving cars until Google, got deeply involved after they were already a little way along, we hear a lot about safety. 
And to get to Mark's point, though, safety, or this is not Mark's point, I shouldn't describe it to him. I will say that safety could go either way. It is an open question whether self-driving cars are gonna be safer than human-driven cars. We don't have what Mark was suggesting with peer-reviewed clear data, I would say. And yes, a self-driving car is not gonna drive drunk or be exhausted, but it's also gonna make technological errors that a human wouldn't do. And I think we had a horrific example of that, potentially, I don't know yet, but potentially, on October 2nd, when that woman was dragged 20 feet below a cruise vehicle that was trying to pull to the side of a curb. It doesn't seem like a human driver would likely have done that. So, so those are, that's sort of how I approach it. Um, but if I could, I think that I wanna go one step further and actually ask a question that I've wrestled with about the safety piece in particular, because I think especially in, this, in the wake of now we've had one person get killed in the pursuit of self-driving cars, Elaine Hertzberg, with that crash with the uh, Uber prototype in Tempe. And now we have a woman who's, in, who's still in the hospital, hope she's gonna be okay, but it looks like it's a very serious condition that she's in. Um, there are real safety questions about the technology that's being put on the roads, at least for certain companies, it seems. Um, and I, I actually would question, again, this is something that, that I know Mark has actually been involved in thinking about. Um, and I wrote about this in, in The Verge a few years ago, maybe we need to really revamp our automotive regulations to account for an autonomous era. Because cars are turning into computers. And for, since for basically we have decided that we are going to have a self-certification framework. Unlike Europe, self-certification framework for car safety. That means that as long as a car adheres to federal motor vehicle safety standards, it can be sold. There's nothing in FMVSS about ADAS, nothing in about an autonomous system. Cruise did not get any approval before it started sending out its AVs in California and, and a few other places. Um, that, and, and NHTSA can only get involved if it, there is evidence of a defect after those cars are already on the road, potentially endangering others. This is not how Europe works. Europe has type approval which means that the, that the automakers have to submit their new models and their new features for approval. If it's something that is new and not in the books, they have to demonstrate that that feature is at least as safe as it was already there. That's why autopilot in Europe had to be changed, but in several ways to make it safer, get rid of some stupid gamification, sorry, I said stupid. I think it's stupid. Gamifications with some features that the European regulators thought, thought was not safe. That had to be removed, and in, in the US, no such problem, because we have no regs about that. So. The, the, so this idea of, of requiring pre-approval is something the U.S. has never done with cars, but Europe does do. And as cars turn into computers, I think that it makes a lot of sense because it's a whole system that has to function perfectly in order to keep people safe. And you may say, oh, it's un-American. How could we do that? We need to let the free market roll. Well, this is literally what we do in aviation with the FAA, right? And, the, and, and a per passenger mile basis, aviation is a thousand times safer than driving. A thousand times. Like yes, it's expensive to have all those people doing quality control, and yes, it costs money for the, for the, the private sector to go through those processes, but I would question, as cars turn into r moving computers, whether it's time to think seriously about regulating cars in the way that we regulate planes. Thank you. Yeah, I have a question. I got one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'll we'll ask a question in the second round. The, the, the question is the following, right? M many of the downside that you described is a continuation of cars, right? The, the problem with AV is a problem of cars here, right? And uh, whether AV play a role very much depend on what's the urban structure, what's the regular framework that enabled it to do things, right? So here, the, the question for you is that, uh, do you think that now we have AV, this is actual opportunity to correct the many wrongs that we have, even in the current car world, so that either it's autonomous or human-driven car can be better anyway. Can AV be a political opportunity to change this, right? So then let's get, leave that to the second round of the discussion, right? Yeah. But before yeah, that, uh, uh, they've asked the question about why, right? Uh, uh, Chris, you invest in many of the AV companies. Tell us why. I think I invest in, in autonomy because of a philosophy around how do you maximize human and humanity's flourishing. And what I mean by that is people like to frame things in interesting ways. We talk a lot now in the modern zeitgeist about the climate. 
I think the climate is incredibly important. I don't think it's more important than humans or humanity. So how do we maximize and save the climate in a genuine way which serves all of us in this room and our children and our prodigy for generations to come? Autonomy, I believe, will do that. And I'm a man of science and numbers. And I would offer to you empirically that autonomy is safer, safer than human, human driving right now. Is it safer than human driving in geospatials in which you have both autonomous systems and humans? TBD. I would arguably it is. I would argue that it is many times over, but let's assume that the data is still out. Let's wait for the data to come in. But if we look at where autonomous is deployed in definitive geospatials on a full stack scenario, you know those vehicles are safer and are better serving those communities because there's not the fly in the ointment that is the human in that programming opportunity in terms of how it's going back and forth. Now, I'm a good son of Detroit. I love driving. I love cars. Um, I believe strongly that empowering the American or the Western or humans broadly around the ability to go to point A to point B and give them that freedom of mobility is really, really important. And I think that the ability to move, I, tr I do believe it gives people dignity. But why do I invest in these opportunities? Because I think while we had in 2017, 16, 18, this peak kind of excitement around what it could be. And then you've seen many companies bottom out as they're continuing to think about can they deploy fast enough to create revenue. I'm glad David brought up aviation because I think aviation is a fantastic example of where autonomy is going. When we first started to fly planes, it was incredibly dangerous. It was asked, should we actually stop doing this? Why in the world would we put people at risk by choosing to fly at these speeds and in this dangerous contraption which has no assurance that it will land where it's, when it takes off? I think we're in a very similar place when it comes to autonomous vehicles. And I think those of us who think that, I, again, I'm all for empowering the human driver, but the idea that human drivers, teenagers who first get their license looking at their devices while looking at their full set infotainment centers in their brand new Ford Bronco, which is a beautiful vehicle, um, that's not safer. It's not. And all of us here who have common sense know this to be true. So we have to, again, I think we have to look at what do we know about humanity? How do we establish the very best of, of how it can actually take advantage of the resources we have on this earth while ensuring we're, taking it, we're looking after those resources? But it cannot be the other way around. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, now the second round, first of all, feel free to comment to, to any other panelists' uh, prior remarks uh, to that, right? Yeah. So one question uh, back to you, Ra Raquel. Uh, you, you mentioned simulation has become more and more powerful too, both in terms of developing the, the control, but also as a way to verify the effectiveness of this, right? So first of all, give us a little bit of detail about, uh, because simulation is an overloaded word. We have so many different simulations. How do we characterize certain simulation what type of power that it has, right? And then relate to that is uh, uh, often the challenge is how much realism this uh, 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 simulation has over the, uh, compared to reality, right? You've been working on how do even scientifically define the notion of realism and a merit to that, right? Because if we can answer this question, then we can answer the question of what type of data is sufficient to prove whether AV is safer or not, right? We've been, we've been debating this a lot of the time on this. We are never going to wait for we accumulate one billion mile before we answer the question. We have some alternative methodology to this. Seems to you offer a potential alternative to that. Right? Share us with that. All right, uh, my favorite question, and hopefully uh, whoever is playing the video, you can play it, uh, you can click repeat uh, so that it goes on a loop uh, so that people can see. And uh, I'm not sure the screens are good enough in terms of the resolution, but um, I wanted to start with just a little quiz for everybody, um, which is there is a whole bunch of different videos uh, on the screen. And my question to you is, can you guess which ones are simulation versus the real world? And unfortunately, the screens are not super high resolution. It's a problem with the screen on the simulator. <laughs> I can show you my computer afterwards. It works to play smooth, and, uh, but not. Any thoughts? Mm 
Mm -hmm. I will get to your uh, point in a second. Uh, any takers? <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. So I just wanted to trick everybody, right? So they are they are all simulation. That's correct. But humans cannot make a difference, and machines cannot make a difference, right? And in this simulator, every agent that you see here is an AI system in itself. We can drive, you know, our software or everybody's software in the simulator. The simulation reacts to you. You react to it. All this runs in real time in the cloud, and you only need one GPU per simulation. Right, all super efficient. And this is the tool of the future, right? It enables you to really test everything that potentially can happen on the road. More importantly, the simulation can also assess how well you are doing. It can tell you where you're making mistakes versus not. So it can train the software also to do better and better and better. Here you can actually simulate all those rare cases that it's gonna take you billions of miles to observe even for the first time. You can also generate accidents and other things. How, how do we know that we can handle those? We're not gonna create accidents on purpose to actually validate that our system is doing the right thing, right? So you need a, you know, a tool of this form. And this is, you know, this is Gen AI. There is no other technology that can do this, right? So, and one of the things I'm very excited is actually to potentially provide this to regulators as a way to certify everybody's system. And why we can do this? Because we can simulate any sensor available in the industry. We can, uh, you know, um, test any system so long as you know you give a black box software, it can be tested on the simulator, right? So this is a huge enabler. Right now, it's not a product uh, that we sell externally. It's internal for Wabi. As we develop our self-driving trucks, you can understand that that's you know a huge you know uh, enabler for going ahead of the competition much faster and whatnot. But uh, safety is not proprietary, so I'm very, very you know, excited about potentially give that to the regulators. And they're very, very interested as well. Right? And to your point about you know, Euro versus the States, um, I think that it's very important to do things in a scientific manner. No surprises, I'm a professor, right? It's in my DNA. Uh, but it's very important as well to provide evidence that, for example, what I show you here that looks very realistic, and I fool you all, right? Um, is also something that we can provide as scientific evidence. And that's what you, we can do with uh, our simulator is that uh, we have a way, and you're gonna see some very exciting white papers soon, that proves scientifically that indeed the level of realism is such that whatever happens on the road happens exactly on the simulator. And whatever happens on the simulator happens exactly on the real world. So this enables you to also know what is your system not capable, not capable of doing today. For the rest of the industry, it's very difficult to say because, well, I haven't observed it, so it's the unknown unknown, I don't know. Maybe, you know, I still need five years to get to driverless or whatever it is that you're trying to do. Here, you can have full control and full knowledge about what is left to do so that you can really have a very uh, good roadmap in terms of, you know, what are your next milestones, what do you need to focus on, et cetera. Um, so this is, you know, the kind of technology that can really enable that safe future where you can actually provide evidence of safety so that even the skepticals uh, can actually see this. And in terms of, you know, this technology has many, many advantages. Uh, for us, we focus on tracking, long haul tracking is a terrible job for humans, right? Um, I don't know how, we know, if you have actually been on a truck uh, and taken, you know, a across the country trip, uh, you know, is uh, humans typically work 80 to 100 hours a week when they do this, they go you know, many weeks on the road. It's very hard to have a family. At the same time, one thing that maybe is less known is that uh, there is only 7% of the parking needed is available. So oftentimes, they have to park on a, say, Walmart parking lot where they don't even have access to toilets. They don't have showers, right? You don't want humans to be doing this. You, need, you want humans to be doing the local PL so that they can go back home. Right? So for me, technology is how can we enhance humans, not replace them, right, to have a better life. And I think there is so many advantages beyond safety, beyond obviously uh, sustainability is huge with uh, whistle driving as well. Well, thank you. The, the prospect you may share this uh, verifier with the regulator and potentially share across the industry so that we're a coherent way to demonstrate to, to what degree we are improving. That would be very exciting on this, right? Uh, thank you for doing that. Uh, uh, Nick, uh, on this, uh, in our prior pr prep call, you mentioned that you anticipate when this uh, AV scale up, you will 
we will see a lot of litigation going on, right? This is just whatever, however good it is, when we play, there will be mistakes, there will be issues there, right? You even, you even mentioned the word, there will be something like a nuclear verdict around this, right? Given, given the US, uh, like a legal system is very reactive, right? We don't plan first, but something happened, let's respond to it, right? How would this, you, you anticipate play out? Would this nuclear verdict potentially kill a certain company or potentially even industry? Or we could potentially take the lesson actually moving forward on it. What do you see play out? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think one of the things that we think about the most is this happens today. I mean, you see in the news regularly very large <laughs> verdicts based on an incident that happened. In trucking in particular, this already happens. Um, it's likely that, you know, as you move forward with tech companies or you know, robots driving vehicles are not going to be a sympathetic party in, in the event that, that a truck rolls over and, and kills a family. And so, one, you're just going to have an incident where it's going to be a, a very difficult situation with damages that are likely to play out in the court, just absent any uh, extra challenges. But then on top of that, this gets back to what Mark was saying, there's, there's a risk here for a big finger pointing situation. So what we don't really have right now is we don't have a common scenario where there are this many parties involved in a typical auto accident. Like right now, the, one of the philosophies of auto insurance is you get there, you quickly pay a claim, you get the party back up on their feet as fast as you can or remediate them for damages. In a world where you have product liability where someone gets hurt, that's a really difficult um, and, uh, framework where you're suing each other, you're pointing fingers. And so if you're going into a world where the, there's all those different entities that I mentioned before, they're all gonna be named in a lawsuit. You're going to have a family there who's, you know, had some damage or you know, people were, were, were killed. No one's going to feel sorry for the parties. And then if you try to, every people is pointing fingers at each other and saying, well, no, it wasn't actually my decision making of the, the, the software. It was actually the LiDAR system. But then the LiDAR system was installed wrong by the, the OEM manufacturer who was doing it at the plant. This just gets really bad. And then all of a sudden your, your outcomes are going to be really high. And it's going to create a scenario where this isn't sustainable. You can't just go in and have an incident that's, in our view, is going to happen. We don't anticipate going from, you know, the, the current state to zero crashes. Like, we, we are more realistic. Like, we think there will be continued progress. But if, if you don't come up with a framework to address that, it's, it's going to be problematic and could slow things down. But the reality is we haven't seen a lot of momentum to try to proactively address this. So we're, one of the things that we're spending a lot of time on is, okay, how do you try to, to minimize the challenge that's gonna be happen in those first incidents so that it doesn't be a $100 million claim where there's $40 million in legal fees and, and everyone's in a bad scenario. So a lot of that can be done preemptively based on the contractual arrangements that happen, um, the, the predetermined liability. But then we haven't actually spent a lot of time talking about the data since, since Mark raised it up, but one of the benefits of autonomous vehicles is you have this plethora of information that can help more accurately determine, you know, liability. So if we, uh, if there's public access to the decisioning of the software system, I saw this from the camera and I made a decision to turn left, and you can use that information to understand what actually happened with the cameras themselves around the vehicle. You're more likely to quickly get to an answer um, and and determine it quickly, accurately, and, and avoid some of those. So I think. The, the more proactive we can be as a group in trying to anticipate that, I think will help. But ultimately, in, in my view, I think it's probable that we will need a different liability framework going forward because the current setup is not optimized for this type of arrangement. And thank you, Nick. Uh, 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 David, back to you. First of all, thank you for offering the critique and the challenge it's view. One thing I, uh, I, I put in my, my optimistic view on this, saying that AV potential has as a political excuse to reform our mobility policy. Is this realistic or you don't think the, I mean, for example, we messed up in managing cars. Doesn't matter AV or human. Yeah, we didn't have a good structure for that, right? Do you think this situation is just never going to change? Therefore, whatever wrong cars we have, AV will just exacerbate it. Or there's some chance that uh, our society regular firm can do better on this? Sure. Um... Well, you're not the only one who had put that optimistic scenario out there, saying AVs offer a chance to reimagine our cities for the better. That is very much what Cruz and Waymo say themselves. <clears throat> you can find lots of references to transit and bikes and walking on the Cruz and Waymo websites as part of, the, so in, in, I think they're trying to present themselves as, as part of like the big, happy, sustainable mobility family, especially in urban areas. Um, I'm not 
I think it's a good marketing strategy, <laughs> but I'm not sure I think that there's anything, uh, th there's a there there, <clears throat> if you will, because, uh, yeah, I mean, you sort of said it yourself, um, just like electric car, I wrote a long article this week about in Vox about Norway's experience with electric cars, like the Norway EV miracle. They're still cars and they've screwed over Norwegian cities because everybody who has an EV in Norway is now like, well, I did you all a favor by, and the planet a favor by having electric cars. So how dare you take away parking or do a road diet or make a pedestrian free street? Because then I can't use my EV that I got to help save the world. It did you a favor when I got it. And, and, so, and just like EVs are still cars, autonomous vehicles are still cars. Uh, they still need to be, they still, their value relates to being able to travel in an unimpeded way um, and to go, to go quickly, uh, as quickly as, as is feasible. And that is, and this, the fundamental problem is that, you know, a, a, a car or a car sized vehicle transporting a single person in a dense city is not an efficient means of conveyance. It's just not, and it's not going to be a clean, sustainable means of conveyance compared to alternatives like transit, walking, and biking. So um, there is an inherent tension, I think, between those truly sustainable modes, I would argue, and any kind of car, including autonomous ones. And the one sort of argument I've heard when I had discussed this with the AV representatives, and I have many friends who work at AV companies, and we, we, we talk it out. I don't think there, no one's a bad person here. It's a matter of what's true. And often I hear about like repurposing parking saying like, oh, because AVs won't need to park, it'll free up all of the street parking that can be used uh, in other ways. That's something that should especially appeal to Henry Graybar over here, who wrote a great book called Pave Paradise, all about parking. Um, but my, my response to that, which Henry will probably guess, is you don't need AVs to repurpose street parking, which is a terrible use of extremely scarce, valuable public property. Amsterdam and Paris, among other cities, are repurposing street parking like by tens of thousands of spots without any AVs at all. So I'm not sure that's a particularly credible response. Mm. My, in, in some, no, I don't think that AVs are really a path toward rethinking our streets in a more multimodal, sustainable way for the better. I don't see it. Right. Uh, we, we are running out of time. I, in the last, I would like to invite each one of you to offer one hope of AVs. So in the next, say, two years, if this thing happens, Right, you will be happy in this. Be as specific as you can, but it will leave you to, to judge that, right? Let me add one, one thought from my point of view, uh, which is, uh, I think in terms of the, the collective learning about AV, we are not doing a good job, right? When something happens, it's okay we make a mistake, but how much we learn from it, right? We, I think we, for now, have a very limited way to learn from it. Right. That relate to this uh, data sharing, that relate to the transparency, that relate to this whole industry coming together. Uh, Mark gave an example that in the airline industry, you do not compete on safety. Right. This is a public good there. Right. But in cars, somehow we do. Right. Is, it, is it possible for us to get over that, to really share this uh, safety situation and that everybody can improve together? Right. So that's one hope I have. Right. So I'll get the, the panelists to offer your thought on this. Maybe go the other way around. Right? David, you go. Uh, yeah, I'll go really quickly. The two things I'd like to see is, number one, a rethink about, uh, like I was saying, a, re a rethink of how we regulate cars so that we can pre-approve AVs to make sure that people really can have confidence that what's on the public roads is safe. And then second of all, I hope that uh, the AV companies can prove me, can show me why I was wrong, what I was saying earlier when I said it's not been clear to me what self-driving cars are going to do to actually make our society better. I've just not heard a clear articulation. Too much has been based on I think unconvincing arguments around safety or just the gee whiz, it's so cool that we could do this. It's not good enough. I'd like to hear a real clear response and perhaps now as there's more of a public debate about this tech now, technology, I'll get it. I hope I will. I would say, you know, I agree with the idea that it's highly likely that autonomous vehicles will be safer than human drivers. Human drivers are, are not great and it's a very low bar. And so I think the more that we can kind of create transparency in that information, sharing and, and standards and benchmarks to try to you know, share with the public, with each other, so that that can be understood if it's tracking in that direction, we could start to get some more momentum. But I think everybody kind of operating in silos is a bit difficult for anyone to digest. So I think the more that we can kind of make that a, a, a more common approach would be valuable. Right. Thanks, Nick. Raquel? 
I'm going to go with a very similar kind of direction, which is transparency and accountability and a much more scientific rigor on uh, what we see out there. And, uh, you know, yes, explain what your system does, what it doesn't, what it can do, and what you hope they will, it will do. And I think that will bring us, you know, to the next level. Great. Thanks. Chris? Yeah, I, would, I would echo that. And I'd say if we can prove empirically the many times over increased safety of autonomy, and if we define that the public is much more willing and wanting of those solutions, that we will craft our policies around what the public wants and what the data proves. And I suspect that, that will happen, if not in the next two years, in the next 10. Great, yeah. Please join me, thank this panel. It's great, yeah, thank you.